trial of George Zimmerman, race was interjected into testimony. Our coverage of the killing of Trayvon Martin, the trial of George Zimmerman, begins with Randall Pinkston and the sometimes testy testimony on Thursday. About For a second day, George Zimmerman's defense attorneys tried to undermine the testimony of the prosecution's star witness, Rachel Gentel, who was on the phone with Trayvon Martin in the minutes before he was killed. Defense attorney Don West zeroed in on her testimony that she heard Trayvon saying, get off, get off, when he encountered Zimmerman. And you don't really know who actually said that, even if it were said, do you? Yes, sir. It could have been Trayvon, is what you said, correct? Yes, sir. And West challenged Gentel's explanation about why she initially didn't tell authorities about her phone conversation with Martin. But the reason you didn't do anything about it, tell anybody what you had heard, come forward to the police, is because in your mind it was just a fight. Correct? Yes, sir. And, in fact, it was just a fight that Trayvon Martin started. That's why you weren't worried. That's why you didn't do anything. It was because Trayvon Martin started the fight, and you knew that. Objection. Compound question, badgering the witness. You may answer. No, sir. Gentel testified the 17-year-old teen tried to get away from Zimmerman, feeling he was being stalked as he was returning to the apartment where he was living with his father. The prosecution charges Zimmerman profiled Martin because he was a black teen. But the defense raised another possibility. What's one, one thing about what Trayvon Martin told you that made you think this was racial? Describing the person. Pardon me? Describing the person. I, I just didn't... Describing I, the person that was watching him and following him, I sir. See. Describing the person is what made you think it was racial? Yes. And that's because he described him as a creepy-ass cracker? Yes. So it was racial, but it was because Trayvon Martin put race in this. No. After Thursday's testimony, the family of Trayvon Martin talked about race and also having to hear 911 calls. But at this time on the stand, we have a witness, Jonathan Good, who is one of the neighbors of George Zimmerman, and he's describing what he saw and heard on the night Trayvon was shot. Let's listen so in. that got your attention enough that you um, turned off or muted the TV, right? I muted the TV, correct. Okay. And then what was the very next thing that caught your attention? I heard it again, but it seemed like it was getting a little louder. Could you tell at that point where it was coming from? It just seemed like it was getting closer. Fortunately, it is critical for them to listen to it and to get a feel for it. But yeah, sure, it's going to be an emotion-packed event. We're still talking about a murder case where a 17-year-old's life was lost and another one's on the line. So, you know, we've got a lot to, to deal with and a lot to worry about within the emotions of the case. Having said that, I think that Everyone is doing a pretty good job of keeping us on task and on track. When you try to inject race into a case like this here, that means you're trying to push somebody who's making a decision one way or the other. And that's not what you want. You want a nice, and one thing I agree with, I listened to Mr. O'Mara's press conference, I agree with him. We want a nice, fair proceeding. And those were comments made by the attorney for uh, Trayvon Martin's parents, Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin, as well as uh, comments by defense attorney Mark O'Mara, who is defending George Zimmerman. Uh, we, want, we want to listen to several parts of the trial. But before I do, I want to introduce our guests that are here in the store, in the studio with us. Uh, our Rise News legal contributor, Seema Iyer, joins us. And she's been with us all through this trial and other legal matters, as well as good friend to Arise News, Joey Jackson, who is a legal analyst and also an attorney. Thank you guys both for coming in. Man, these last few days have been packed with action and, and information. Let me just ask uh, our executive producer, Dick, do you want to hear from uh, John Good now? All right, let's do that right now. As I just mentioned a moment ago, one of the witnesses on the stand right now is a neighbor of George Zimmerman. He is Jonathan Good, describing what he saw and heard the night Trayvon Martin was killed. I think you stated, but your testimony in terms of whether you the person on the top was holding down the person at the bottom, could you tell? I said that could have been possible, okay. as there was arm motion going downward, not just once, but multiple times. Okay. So you, you can't say one way or the other? Whether, <laughs> or can you say? 
I can't 100% say, no. You mentioned you said something. Did you yell that out, or did you say please, or how, did you, how would you describe it? And if you could, as best you can, recreate that in whatever tone of voice you use to say something. That's pretty hard going back to that date on the tone of voice. Okay. Was it loud? It was enough for that I thought they would be able to hear me. Okay. Yes. And again, what do you recall saying to the two individuals? At first it was, what's going on? And no one answered. Um, and then at that point, I believe the person on the bottom I could finally see and I heard a help. Um, and then at some point I said, uh, cut it out. And then I'm calling 911. Is that when I, I thought it was getting really serious? Okay. And when you're stating what you're saying, are you doing that pretty quickly or are you taking your pausing like you are now? I would say pausing. Okay. And I think that would equate to about the time that I said to. Okay. But you're, are you, you're yelling it or saying it loud voice so they yes. can hear? You mentioned that uh, when you first stepped out, I neglected to ask you, at that time, did you hear any kind of yelling at any time from one of the two individuals out there? Not initially when I stepped out. Okay. And when you did step out and you said something, did any of the individuals prior to you saying something, did they, did you hear any of the individuals saying something at that point? No. Okay. And you mentioned that they said something. Was that after you said something to the individuals? Yes. Okay. Could you say unequivocally to this jury who was saying something? 100% no. Okay. And why is that? I'm just taking it off of being rational. And you believe the person on the bottom would have been saying something when they observed you? Correct. And if it was coming from on top, it would have echoed off a wall instead of coming okay. directly at me. But can you say unequivocally that it was the person on the bottom versus the person on the top? Sorry, Your Honor, that would be asked and just answer. Can you say unequivocally that it was the person on the bottom versus the person on the top that was saying no? Not 100%, no. Okay. And in regard to the person that said help, if you can, the person that said help, was it help, 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 continuous, or was it, or how would you describe it, more than one? I believe it was just one or maybe two. Okay. And then after that, did it, did what happened? That's when they moved up onto the sidewalk. Okay. At that point, what happened? That's when I saw them in the straddle position, thought it was getting very serious, and said I was calling 911. And of course, that was John Good, one of the neighbors of George Zimmerman, describing what he heard and saw the night that Trayvon Martin was shot. Again, we have here in the studio with us Seema Iyer, Joey Jackson. You know, these these. Uh, test, the testimony of these neighbors, which is the closest thing that we can come to witnesses to the event, are so important. Are you finding that they are corroborating uh, the prosecution's version of events or the defense's version of events? Joey, let's start with you. Okay, listen, it's a difficult case, and here's why. Because you don't have an actual neighbor to say, I saw Trayvon Martin move to the left, I saw George Zimmerman move to the right, I heard Trayvon Martin screaming. They're all about equivocation. You heard what he was talking about. About, right? And uh, Del Lurianda, the prosecutor, could you say unequivocally? And when that answer becomes no, it leads to reasonable doubt. And that's a problem for the prosecution. But also, what I don't understand is why are they allowing so many witnesses to say the same thing? It becomes a point where it's cumulative, as our legal jargon calls it. And especially with this witness, Mr. Good, he's not unequivocal. He's not 100%. Right. He's lending himself to reasonable doubt and speculation. So in my and opinion, as point, a defense attorney, I would have objected. And to Seema's point. point, the point is, I like, I like cumulative yeah, testimony yeah. when it helps me. Mm -hmm. And when a whole bunch of people are getting on the stand and everyone's saying, I saw Trayvon Martin and he was under attack, he was fighting for his life, he was yelling help, I want a parade of people to say that. But when you have cumulative testimony that is equivocal, we don't know, it could have been, I'm not sure, I'm being rational, it's not necessarily helpful. And on top of that, we heard from one of the other neighbors yesterday at the end of the day, Salma Mora, who uh, used a translator. She spoke in Spanish, yes, and yes. she said that she saw the person on the top had a red jacket on. She described it as red. We know, which or, is George Zimmerman. Which jacket. is George Zimmerman. He actually had an orange jacket on. However, I've been following tweets from reporters that are in the in the courtroom, and one of the reporters is saying that this witness, John Good, said that he saw the person in the red jacket on the bottom. Ah. But he's still not sure. He's still not 100%. 
And, and it, so that's reasonable doubt. So yes. why would you call him as a witness? It's a difficult thing. And in any case, just to be clear, there's always going to be some measure of inconsistency. Every witness doesn't necessarily say the same thing, and that also leads to doubt. And that's a, and that's a big problem. But as Joey knows, because Joey's an ex-prosecutor, what prosecutors get up and say on summation is that being equivocal is the hallmark of truth, right, Joe? Absolutely, because that means that everyone's not lined up to say the same thing. If we were lying, we'd have everyone here in unison telling the same story. But the fact that they're telling different stories means they're telling the truth. What that truth is, though, who knows? And you know, it's so interesting. In the, in the clip that we just watched of John Good, you heard Bernie Delarionda asking him, if you can, can you approximate the tone of voice that you use? Can you sort of reenact it? And John Good kind of declined to do that. But he had also asked a previous witness who, to sort of act out what she did in her kitchen while she was watching. Why is that important? Well, Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> what you want to do in any scenario is you want to bring the jury there. Exactly. You want to take them to that moment. You want to take them to that place. You want to take them to the drama. And you also, in doing that, now make it more credible because you're reliving it with the witness who's reliving it before the jury. That's and then that witness's memory is also corroborated. Right? Because this happened so long ago, and you want this witness to come before the jury and say, I remember this incident today as well as I remembered it in February 2012. Which is so important. Now, one of the most dramatic moments so far was the playing uh, on the phone of the neighbor who made the call to 911, Jennifer Lauer. Let's listen to a little bit of what she has to say. This is her call. 911, do you need police or medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. Okay, what's the address that they're near? 1211 Twin Trees Lane. Twin Trees Lane? Is this in the Twin Lake Town Tom's in Sanford? Yes. Okay, and is it a male or female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick. Say, yeah. Does he look hurt? I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right. What is your number? Just there's gunshots. You just heard gunshots? Yes. How many? This one. Of course, that's that dramatic moment that we remember hearing being played in the news all year long since the incident happened. But later, the defense asked Lauer how she would characterize George Zimmerman. This is what she had to say. In your conversations and the little interaction you have with Mr. Zimmerman, did he ever seem or come across to you to be angry? No. Upset? What we might call a hothead? No. Um, any concerns at all? that his involvement with Neighborhood Watch was unusual? No. Inappropriate? No. So the type of, I want to be a vigilante, so I'm going to go start a Neighborhood Watch. Very, very effective witness here. Of course, she's the one that made that call that we've all heard uh, all along, but then goes on to sort of describe him as a good guy. Well, I would dismiss that. You know, everyone's going to have a certain opinion, but does everyone become an expert as to what is a vigilante or what is Neighborhood Watch? Yeah. I don't put too much credibility in what she says. You know, well, this is what Omar was doing. What he did with this witness was say, well, wait a minute, you know George Zimmerman, you know his character, and in essence, in knowing him, you know he's a pretty reasonable, decent person. Now, you match that up against the 911 call where you hear, help, 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 someone's crying for their life, and then boom, it makes it appear as though it was George Zimmerman who was screaming and crying because he, according to Omar and this witness, is the reasonable person who's not a hothead who wouldn't be attacking. And that's what the defense is trying to do. And of course, if they do it effectively, then the jury is left to conclude he was under attack in imminent fear of his life and acted rational, rationally, reasonably, and in accordance with the law. And of course, the closest thing that the prosecution has to an eyewitness is Trayvon Martin's childhood friend, Rachel Gentile, who spent a total of like seven hours on the stand over two days, was, uh, was cross-examined extensively. Some of her statements were very powerful, could be considered very damning to George Zimmerman, but yet there were all these inconsistencies. <laughs> yeah. I feel very strongly about Rachel Jantel in that I support her testimony and I don't put a lot of weight in her inconsistencies. Here's my point. Lying in life is different than lying in court. And I think if we all take a step back and see, is this girl, was she lying in court? Is she being honest? 
on the stand. And I think she was. I think she is credible. I think she made little inconsistencies about her life. When she lies about her age, it wasn't because she was lying about her observations, what she heard, her conversation with Trayvon Martin. She had a reason for every inconsistency, and I completely support and believe everything she said. Yeah, I mean, and people do lie about their age. That's something that's common. Now, just a couple of points not about me, her, right? <laughs> of course not. Are you kidding? Now, look, the point is, is that she appears to be credible because she's real. She is who she is. Like her, love her, hate her. There's a cultural divide between her, the jury, and a lot of other people in America. But the fact is, she is who she is. She didn't come and try to be polished, trying to be someone who she wasn't, and that makes it more authentic, though I do have a broader concern about her testimony. But Joy, let me Which ask is, you this, because, okay. you, you know, I, I um, you know, I could understand her mainly except for when she was so soft-smoking. I was sort of used to the style in which she speaks. However, being real and being who she is and being consistent on the things that matter, uh, is it difficult, but, though, to overcome from a juror's standpoint? If you are not used to that cultural divide, can you forget the fact that you can't understand That's... it? Can you forget the attitude that she showed on that the first day. That is my big concern that I was just expressing to okay. you. That's my concern. There's a cultural divide. Are you going to judge her based on that? Are you going to be able to get over the fact that there are these inconsistencies because of that? Are you going to be too harsh on her because of that? And finally, the biggest concern I have is are you going to say, you know what, I don't like her. I think she doesn't necessarily fit into my mold of who a person should be. And this was a friend of Trayvon Martin's. And so is he like that? And does he behave like that? And if he does, do does the jury make judgments about him that maybe he's a hothead who would have attacked George Zimmerman? Okay. That's my concern. Let's stop our discussion right now. Going on live right now in the courtroom in the trial of George Zimmerman, John Good is still on the stand, and he's yeah, talking he's about like who he saw like on top or bottom during like the, the scuffle. The Let's listen in. Because usually when someone's on top, the person on the bottom is the one <laughs> screaming or yelling, and that was when I heard that, but I didn't hear anything after that. Okay. And balancing, you're trying to be literal and just tell us exactly what you remember observing and using your common sense. Do you think that it was the person on the bottom who was screaming for help? I mean, rationally thinking, I would think so. Okay. Matter of fact, I think you said in response to Mr. Delaranda's question, had it been Trayvon Martin screaming for help, since his back was to you, it would have had to be going the yell would be going away from you, and I think you said it would have to bounce off the wall before you heard I mean, it. And I think it would sound different. Okay. That's why in my head it, I thought it was coming from the person on the bottom. And the sound that you heard was sounding like a person screaming from 15 or 17 feet away, almost directly at you, right? It sounded like it was coming towards me, correct. Okay. Now, um, and, and I'm sorry to jump back to that. I, I apologize. I, so they are now moved up. They are now in the true ground and pound position. Um, and Mr. Delarionda, I think, made some histrionics about what you heard and what you didn't hear. So I, I now have to do it as well. Okay. Did you hear something like this? No. Okay. Could something like that have happened without you being able to hear it? Speculation. Speculation. Were you paying attention to the noise of the ground and pound that you were watching? Probably not. Okay. I was just seeing to make sure if it was serious or not, and that's when I went have, back inside. Have you ever heard the sound of a skull being smacked against concrete? I can't remember. Have you heard the sound of a fist driving into a, a nose or a head or a face? I can't remember. So while it wasn't the histrionics that Mr. Delarionda suggested, um, it certainly could be, it could have occurred that Mr. Trayvon Martin was hitting Mr. Zimmerman, but you just don't remember today the sound of that? Objection, speculation. Sustained. Uh, rephrase your question. Sure, I'll rephrase it. You're certainly not telling this jury that you're certain that Mr. Martin wasn't striking George Zimmerman in the face, right? Can you repeat that? Yeah. You're certainly not telling this jury that you know that Mr. Martin was not striking George Zimmerman in the face. You just I can't 100% confirm that that was happening. Right. <laughs> and you just don't want to say that Trayvon Martin 
was taking Joe Zimmerman's head and hitting it on the cement because you didn't actually see that, correct? Yeah, I couldn't see that. Okay. Because and it was because of the darkness and the positioning of the people. Yes. Okay. You, of course, have um, testified during your deposition and other times regarding um, what you heard and, and the disparity or the seeming disparity between what you remember hearing and what the 911 call seems to indicate, right? If you're referring to the call you played in my deposition, yes. Yes. Um, it just doesn't seem like the same screams to you, does it? Well, one's coming from an audio and one I was hearing in person, so it didn't sound the same to me. So no. you perceived them differently than you heard on the 911 call, correct? Yes. You're certainly not suggesting to this jury that they're not the same screams from different perspectives, are you? I couldn't say. Okay. You are aware that Ms. Lauer's call to 911 um, was timed perfectly with the screams that she heard, and of course the gunshot that you heard, correct? What do you mean? Okay, you heard the gunshot, correct? Correct. And you've also heard that gunshot on Miss Lauer's tape, correct? Correct. Okay, so going back in time from the gunshot backwards on Miss Lauer's tape, you we're heard listening on Ms. live tape to that the proceedings of the trial of George Zimmerman taking place in Sanford, Florida. Florida. This call, is right. the defense attorney Mark O'Mara who is uh, questioning on cross examination one of the neighbors of George Zimmerman, John Good, who's testifying to what he saw and heard on the night Trayvon Martin was killed. Seema Iyer and Joey Jackson in the studio here to talk about this is very interesting interplay that we've seen back and forth. I want to start with what we heard when we first went to it. And he, he asked, uh, Mark O'Mara asked John Good, rationally, do you, can, do you think you can tell who it was that was yelling? And that seems to me to be an uh, outrageous question to ask. I don't even know what rationally means in a, <laughs> in a courtroom setting. Right, right. right. And why didn't the question. prosecution object? Uh, you know, I don't know, but it's the critical question and it's a critical moment in the trial and here's why. Because if you're arguing self-defense, you have to be under attack. And the person who's yelling, help, 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 if that person could be established to be Trayvon Martin, the defense has a major problem. Alternatively, however, if you could suggest from a defense perspective that that person yelling, help, 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 is George Zimmerman, then that's the case right there. So it's a critical question. The answer is critical. I don't know that this witness can speculate about that. That's another issue. Both sides are going to argue that this witness is for them. Both sides are going to find a way to show that Mr. Good supports their side. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't think he should have been called. Yeah, period. It's so interesting, and I want to talk a little bit more about it, but let's take a, just a little break, bit, a bit of a break, talk about some more news that's happening in the country. And there